On this week's Hear These Words, Job uh, answers God after having been a bit disappointed in things and in a surprising way. And also, a high priest unlike any other, what makes Jesus' priesthood eternal and transformative in Hebrews? And finally, a blind man in the Gospel of Mark is able to see what others do not. His boldness leads to a life-changing encounter with Jesus. All this week on Hear These Words. Join us. Welcome to Hear These Words, a podcast and video series from Good Shepherd Episcopal Church in Tequesta, Florida. I'm Sanford Groff. I'm the rector here. And every week on the podcast, we look forward to the upcoming Sunday and the scripture that is assigned for that Sunday by the Revised Common Lectionary. This week is the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, proper 25b. And the words we hear are Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6 and 10 through 17, Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28, and Mark chapter 10, 46 through 52. Well, happy week. Welcome to this new week at the end of October. We're getting ready for um, kind of the sprint to the end of the season after Pentecost on our way. This Sunday is a normal Sunday. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. We will move the Feast of All Saints to that Sunday. Uh, we'll have Giving Sunday the 10th, and then uh, rounding it out at the end uh, of the season is Christ the King Sunday. And then we start up the Sunday immediately after Thanksgiving with Advent. So we'll do Advent 1 through 4, and then, of course, Christmas, Christmas Eve, all that kind of good stuff. So we're in a fairly busy liturgical time of the year. This, um, there's a lot of, of, of stuff going on, and I know in, um, you know, I'm sure your life and in mine, we are busy and we are getting ready for things. And so I know that... Um, I know that sometimes things can get a little bit hectic. So hang in there, and I hope hearing and talking a little bit about Scripture today will be a blessing and helpful way of, you know, getting you centered in your soul and maybe a little pep in your step. Let's take a look at the end of Job, which is what is assigned. We've spent four weeks in Job and we haven't talked about them in the sermons, but we have talked about them on here. And here we come to the, the last part where Job now answers the Lord. The, if you remember from last week, you know, the whole story of Job, God and the Satan have this little bet. And God ends up taking everything away from Job. Job does not curse God and uh, instead laments for 36 chapters about how everything is gone. Finally, God answers. He did this last week in the lectionary, and the answer is, um, you know, less than satisfying is how I would put it. And today we get Job replying to God. And, you know, the first thing he says is, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Um, uh, you know, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful me, for me, which I did not know. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and then, and then the, 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 it's a very short um, little thing that he says. <clears throat> Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So we could kind of sit with that for a little while. And um, again, it is not a way of conversing that we are used to. We, we, this is not kind of a, um, hey, I have a complaint, let me complain to you. Okay, you answer me with a non-answer, so to speak, that doesn't really answer my question. Now I go and I say, oh, you know, you're right and I'm wrong and let me just um, sit here and, and be quiet. Um, that is not how we typically do business. And so I think this, this provides a bit of a challenge for us, not necessarily to try to emulate it uh, word for word, but I think instead, um, 
you know, a good place to start would simply be to recognize our own limitations and our own ability to understand certain things. And, and in that way, it invites us into a humility maybe that is um, quite a bit different than what we're used to. Of course, <clears throat> you keep reading and if you don't want to sit with that, you just keep reading and the Lord restores the fortunes of Job um, twice as much as he had before. And uh, it goes on, um, uh, you know, uh, they, they showed him sympathy, sympathy and comfort for all that the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And he blessed the latter days. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys, seven sons, three daughters, um, and, um, and uh, yeah, you know, all these people. Job lived 140 years, saw his children, his children's children, four generations, and Job died old and full of days. So, so what's, you know, what's interesting here. <laughs> is that um, I think we see resurrection in this story. But it's not a resurrection that I would want to... Um, I don't think the resurrection here fixes the past. I don't think that all of this abundance and this you know fresh new life that Joe lives and leads necessarily answers some of the deep and existential questions that he spent 36 chapters wrestling with. I don't think that's, I don't think it, oh, all these bad things happen to you. Let me, let me make you happy with stuff. And basically you're fine, right? Um, I, I, we don't know how Job took this. We don't get any more commentary or insight into his perspective or, or, or what this is like for him. Um, I, I, I think, though, when we look at our own lives, we might resonate with Job in, in a deep way. I think there's a deeply uh, human aspect to this book. Because for many of us who have, I, I don't really count myself as having been through serious tragedy or grief, uh, but for, but for those who have, there are no answers, right? I mean, there's there's, you know, you can try to get your head around certain things, but but at the end of the day, the question still remains, and yet life continues to go on. There there's new things that that happen. There are new people. There are there is kind of a return of some parts and a not a return of other parts, and so <clears throat> while. While that tragedy and that grief may have shaped and transformed you deeply, so too, um, so too does this this resurrected newness of of abundance um, do the same. But I don't think it I don't think it washes away the old. I think it I think instead it transforms the suffering of the old, not into understanding, not into something that we can point to and say. Oh, that's why, or that's that's what was going on, um, but but rather in a way that perhaps makes us um, more humble, or, or 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 that holds life with a bit of a lighter touch. <clears throat> I don't know what that might look for you, look like for you if you've been in that situation, if you feel like you've had a job like experience, um, but. You know, but but faith really does kind of open up a deeper wisdom. It it allows us to experience that resurrection in a way that maybe without faith we would not be privy to. Um, so there it is. <clears throat> I know some people love Job. I know some people really don't love Job. It's a little bit either love it or hate it. Maybe you're kind of in the middle. I don't know. This morning I'm I'm. Um, this morning, I like it. I just, I don't know if I'm necessarily satisfied by it. But I wasn't satisfied last week either. So I don't think that's the point. But that's where I'm wrestling today. All right. Um, Psalm 34. Uh, you know, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. 
<coughs> Excuse me. And that is a great, you know, kind of psalm. The, the famous part of this psalm is at the end, uh, verse 8, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and you know, for me, has, even though perhaps not intentionally, but has strong Eucharistic overtones in terms of gathering, tasting, and seeing uh, the goodness of the Lord. So I pray that you would um, uh, internally digest the psalm this week. Hebrews 7, verses 23 through 28. This passage highlights kind of the contrast between the mortal priests of old and the eternal high priest who we have in Jesus Christ. So there's, um, you know, there's this kind of, here's how it used to be, and now here's how it is under Jesus. And unlike the previous priests who needed to repeat uh, their sacrifices and, you know, kind of are always, always working, working, working. Jesus's one sacrifice is sufficient for all time. So a very, as Hebrews does, a high Christology. Um, um, and, and, and at the end there, it says, uh, you know, um, uh, this he did once for all when he offered himself um, and, uh, and, and appoints a son who has been made perfect forever forever and so um again i you know maybe maybe we're a little disconnected <clears throat> from the intended audience of this maybe we don't quite have the cultural and religious context to understand fully how this um fully how this would how this would play out but but what I can tell you is that it's kind of a game changer. What Jesus does here is changing the game uh, of how of how access to God was granted, how access to God was mediated, and instead of having to go through um, all of these instantiations with other priests and sacrifices, Jesus comes in uh, with no need to sa offer sacrifices day after day first for our sins and then for those of the people. Uh, this he did once for all when he offered himself. And um, insofar as we can kind of uh, um, grasp that, I think the effect of it is that we always have access, that we always are able to, you know, um, pray and, and, and be with Jesus in a way that allows for even the most difficult things to be assumed by him rather than something that we have to necessarily outsource to someone else. And so, um, you know, knowing, knowing that Jesus continually intercedes uh, on our behalf, it, it, I, think, I think it provides us a little bit of encouragement that we can approach him, that we can go to him, and, uh, and that, and that we, can, we can have that freedom even when we feel like things are a bit constricting or constraining because of whatever the circumstances or, or actions are. So Hebrews, I've talked about it before. It's, it's, it's a tough one. We, we should do a Bible study on it sometime so I can actually read a couple books about it and, and, and be better, uh, better equipped. But we're going to keep moving through to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. We've been working our way through some very difficult passages in Mark. And this part of the chapter is um, a bit of a full circle moment. Here we have Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus is a blind beggar who sits by the roadside. And as Jesus passes by, Bartimaeus shouts out, you know, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people tell him to be quiet. They try to silence him. But he doesn't listen, and he cries out even more, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, call him here. And so he, it says he throws off his cloak, right? He throws off his cloak and goes over to Jesus, springs up, and then Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man says, let me see again. And then Jesus says, go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regains his sight and followed him on the way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Last week, we had uh, Jesus' disciples, James and John, asking, you know, we want you to do whatever it is that we ask of you. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And this is not just a couple verses before. 
And their answer is, we want to sit at your right and your left hand. We want to be in your glory. Um, here, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man says, my teacher, let me see again. And what's interesting about that is twofold. The first thing is, he understands who Jesus is. He, he gets that, that Jesus is who he says he is, and um, he's eager to... He's eager to be with him. He's eager to follow him. Um, and, he's, and he's bold and confident in asking what, what he wants from him. But what he asks, and this is the second thing, what he asks is not... Um, what's interesting is that it is selfish in the, sense that, in the sense that he's wanting something that benefits himself, right? But, but it, is, it is not born out of a place of ego or competition. It's not born out of... A, a a quest for greatness as he sees it or the world sees it. Instead, it's you know it's born out of healing. It's born out of um, a desire to, at some level, um, follow in 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 a newness of life, in a wholeness of life that maybe was eluding him before. And I think here. Um, uh, you know his sight is restored, and 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 he goes on his merry way. It it helps us in this passage to look back a little bit at the last number of weeks where we've been in chapter nine and chapter ten, and chapter nine and chapter ten are really about how the 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 people, the disciples, understand Jesus, and and how that understanding impacts um, not the world kind of at large, but how it impacts the ways of the world or the methods of the world, how, how it reorders things for us. And here the reordering is, um, you know, uh, th that, that, that this message is accessible to the lowly and, and they are brought up, uh, that Jesus lifts up those, uh, he serves those who are downcast and low not not uh, uh, not not those of us who are who are um, not in that situation being made even greater right as James and John would would kind of have you believe and and also not where the law in the case of divorce uh, not in where where the law is um, able to be a an adjudicator you know in a in kind of a, a divisive way uh, Jesus is Jesus here is trying again to now show how that this this new world order is taking shape and and I think Bartimaeus is probably a, a prime prime example of that and then he gets up and follows him. The other thing I think that's interesting about this passage is the silencing of him, right? They, it says, it says he shouts and they try to silence him and um, sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried even more loudly. You know, we, um, in the modern world, we hear a lot of words. We hear a lot of language. We Every, you know, kind of everyone is a platform at some level. But, and, 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 to that, and to that level, I think our conversation has gotten skewed. We've, we've ended up at each other's throats probably more than, more than we would like. But how we, um, how we engage when people try to silence us or how we try to lift up our voice... And, and again, it's, it's not so much that we would lift it up in, in the way that James and John did in order to build myself up, but rather as a way of drawing close to Christ, drawing close to Jesus, so that we might have that which holds us back removed, and that we might follow him having regained our sight, right? Um, th th this, is, this, is, this is the contrast with the disciples, they have a hard time seeing who Jesus is, right? They have a hard time seeing who Jesus is. And yet, here we get in this miracle, not just a physical sight 
uh, regained, but, but we have someone who sees Jesus for who he is and follows and even um, works beyond and above that which the world would put in his way to hold him back. That's, I mean, I think that's the, that's the point here. The point here is, is, is not necessarily just about retinas and eyeballs. It's really about <clears throat> this, this holding together in these two chapters of who Jesus is and how that has changed the ways of the world. And here we see that the ways of the world want to silence Bartimaeus. And he, his, he, he raises his voice up against that. And he, he, he perseveres through that so that he might see truly who Jesus is as he, as he wants to follow and be close to him. Um, as opposed to falling back into the ways of the world and simply rehashing those ways and missing, missing being blind to who Jesus is, missing the sight of who Jesus is. Um, and again, I go back to if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, right? Like these are, these are connected pieces. Um, it's a little hard to kind of see the connection, I think, but, but Jesus here is playing and, and Mark is playing with um, themes that keep coming back over and over and over again. Sight and blindness, seeing and not seeing, knowing and not knowing, right? Asking and being answered, being silenced, right? And, 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 and silencing. Um, and so, uh, anyway, just kind of let that roll around a bit. I think, <clears throat> I think it, it invites us, it does invite us to continue to try to embrace this new way that Jesus is inviting us into. It, it invites us to experiment a bit with, um, what that's going to look like. And, and and I was just reading, uh, this might be a little tangential, but I was just reading about the new presiding bishop-elect, Sean Rowe, who's going to be uh, invested in two weeks on a Saturday on live stream. And he, you know, the article I read basically said his his method is, is grand experimentation. Um, it is not just better programs or better this or better clergy or better, you know, whatever. It's actually trying to um, experiment and see how that goes and then, you know, being able to pivot and move quickly. And so I wonder how, you know, given in light of these passages in Mark, how we at Good Shepherd would continue to try to experiment boldly, not necessarily having all the answers or being able to build the best program, but rather trying things in an agile and nimble way that... Um, we would see the results of and, and, and get a sense for how that works in our own community um, as we prepare to welcome you know, the new presiding bishop-elect, who also, by the way, will be at our diocesan convention this weekend. So keep us in your prayers for that. Certainly keep Bishop Sean Rowe in your prayers as we continue to do uh, the work following, following Jesus. Well, I think that's it for now. I'm very grateful that you joined us for this episode of Hear These Words. I hope you have a great week. If you liked what you heard, give us a thumbs up. Share it with your friends. It's always good to share. Never miss an episode by subscribing. And now I do hope you are prepared uh, this Sunday and this whole week to hear these words. We'll see you soon.